Hi, I'm Carl Baldessar, and in this episode, I'm going to talk about a pretty serious topic. It's stage fright, or maybe by another name, you might call it performance anxiety, or just simply fear of failure. And if you suffer from this, I want to let you know that you're not alone, and I want to share with you some insights and some techniques that I've learned over the years that helps me cope with it. Although I'm going to be talking about this from a musician's perspective, the fact is that all walks of life and professions can bring about performance anxiety. So I hope you find something in here that's applicable to you, even if you're not a musician. Before we get into some of the coping methods that I've learned, let's just define what anxiety is and where it comes from. It's a biological fact that stems from our ancestors. Back in the day, we were threatened every day with life and death situations, and that would set up a triggered response for fight or flight. Now, we no longer are faced with being eaten by a wild beast anymore on a daily basis, but we still have the artifacts of anxiety for fight or flight. And that's really what performance anxiety is coming from. In addition to the biological causes, there's other contributing factors to performance anxiety. And these include lack of preparation or lack of practice, the fear of failure or the fear of mistakes, and self-doubt. But the most important thing to keep in mind about anxiety is that anxiety is normal. I once had a therapist tell me, he said, Carl, I got bad news for you. You are not unique. And that was, rather, that was rather very comforting because I realized that everybody else is in the same situation. So welcome to the club. Everybody has had this. I mean, if you look at the list of people in history from Gandhi to Pavarotti to Eddie Van Halen to Rod Stewart, you name it, your cousins, your uncle, your brother, your sister, your coworkers, everybody has faced some form of performance anxiety in their life. So you're not alone. The second important fact that I want to bring out is that you have to get over the notion that you can completely make anxiety go away. In fact, that will only make you more anxious because anxiety feeds on itself and it feeds on you trying to resist it. So stop resisting. So to illustrate that point, I just want to show you, remember these little finger traps, these little toy finger traps where you'd put your fingers in them and then you start to try to pull them out and you're resisting. This is the same thing of anxiety. The more you try to get away from it, the more tight of a grip it has on you. And so you just have to learn to accept it and relax and let it happen. And I'll talk about the techniques to help you cope with that. Now, the third fact I want to point out here is that anxiety can actually be very helpful. And you might wonder, how is that possible? The reality is that anxiety can actually motivate you to take actions to lessen the effect of anxiety. So it can be helpful, so keep that in mind. And the point here is that you wanna be able to train your mind to interrupt the helpless feeling you have when you have anxiety and actually replace that with action steps that allow you to do something about it. Now there's no rules really, everybody has to kind of figure it out for themselves, but there are four basic tools that I've used to kind of manage the causes of my performance anxiety. And they break out into four categories. It's gonna be preparation and practice, anticipation and visualization, dealing with mistakes and the fear of failure, and last but not least, dealing with self-doubt. Let's take a look at preparation because this is the biggest one. It's like the law of gravity. And the fact is, the more you prepare, the less anxious you become. So there's an inverse correlation between your preparedness and your anxiety. As your preparation goes up, your anxiety is gonna go down. Remember, it won't go to zero but you can reduce your anxiety by being more prepared. Now, practice is the most important form of preparation. And you really got to think about knowing your material. And when I say knowing your material, I'm talking about at a subatomic level, not just on the surface level, but really intimately knowing your material. To truly master your parts, you need to be able to recall them in more than one way in the heat of the moment. Now, I think about this in terms of recall methods, and there's four basic recall methods, okay? There's the physical recall, the visual recall, the harmonic recall, and then the audible recall. And let's break each of those down for you. Number one, the physical recall means knowing the exact fingerings of what you're playing and knowing the mechanics of what you're playing and what finger goes where at what point in time. I'll oftentimes add to this process where I'll actually try to lay in bed and play my parts in my mind physically and really think about, okay, I want to go to E to F to F sharp, A 
to be, to see, and just kind of visualize a line, you know, da 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 Can I actually play that in my mind? And that really helps you know your parts. The second method of recall is being able to visually recall the material. So if you can read music, that's a big advantage. But even if you can't read music, if you can read chord charts, you can read guitar tab, or any kind of symbols that you can remember, that you can look at, because you're going to be processing that in a different way than just the physical recall. I once was working with a great progressive rock musician, really well known, he could not read music, but he created his own symbology. He would really draw stick figures of people. If the one stick figure was wearing a hat, that was a triplet. I mean, it was really his own sort of hieroglyphics, but it worked, and he could look at that and have another way to remember his parts. Now the third recall method is the harmonic analysis recall method. And that's basically trying to understand, you know, from a theoretical basis, what's going on or the context within which your part's being played. So if you're playing just a line, if you know that that's really kind of an arpeggio of a chord, for example, it's going to give you a secondary context by understanding the harmonic context of the music that you're playing. And then the last recall method is using the auditory recall method. And what you want to do is kind of drill your parts into your ear. So it's really helpful to actually sing your parts. It's great to be able to play it on another instrument. And it's also helpful to kind of record your part and listen back. And you kind of put this into your auditory system. And so you have yet again another recall method for your part in the heat of the moment. Now we've talked about doing the hard parts first, but you can't forget about the easy parts because these are the ones that really will trip you up. In fact, sometimes you think you'll know a part and you won't really do those sort of recall methods there. And in the heat of the moment, they just disappear you know, on stage. And Mark Twain had a great quote. He said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And that's really, really true. So don't overlook the easy parts. Use the same thorough getting to know your parts method with your easy parts as well. Now, once you've done all your work, trust the work that you've done. It's not a guarantee that you won't make any mistakes, but it is a guarantee that you won't have regrets that you didn't do the work. So that will help reduce your anxiety. Now, the preparation steps I just talked about were things that you're going to do days, weeks, months in advance, but then you've got the day of the show. So what are some of the preparation things you want to do for the day of the show? Well, I like to do a lot of pre-show visualization. So if you're going to be able to get to the stage, walk on the stage, kind of visualize yourself playing on the stage. If you're lucky and you get a sound check, that's great. You're actually going to be able to completely inhabit that experience. I actually like to get off the stage, go down into the audience and kind of imagine what the audience is going to see and picture myself up there on stage. Anything, anything you can do to create familiarity is going to reduce your stress. Another pre-show tip is to really focus on kind of the mind-body-spirit balance that you, you need to have to perform at your best. And that comes down to basic things like, you know, water and air, you know, for starters. So like hydration is so important. I can't stress that enough. You know, if, if you're only playing a couple of dates a week or whatever, make sure you're hydrating really intently 24 hours before a show. And if you're playing all the time, just always stay hydrated. Man, it lowers your blood pressure. It flushes the toxins that build up in you. It keeps you limber. It increases your memory and it gives you energy. So definitely stay hydrated. And then deep breathing is really, really important. You'd be surprised how many days and weeks will go by without you filling your lungs to capacity with air. If you're anything like me, we just don't do that enough. And when you fill your lungs with air, you'd be shocked at how your brain wakes up. So just remind yourself to fill your lungs to capacity with air. It's really like an instant you know, resolution to anxiety. Let me wrap up by giving you a visualization exercise that I use to reduce anxiety. And it really comes down to the difference between observing your anxiety versus participating with your anxiety. And manage your anxiety comes from being able to observe it, acknowledge it, and name it. And the trouble comes from participating with your anxiety and trying to resist it. So you have a choice. You can either observe it or you can participate with it. So let me give you a visualization technique that illustrates this point. Let's imagine for a second that you're standing on the side of a riverbank. Your feet are firmly on the ground and you're in front of a, a stream or a river and it has just rained overnight and it's filled with water and it's rushing. The torrents and currents are rushing by you. And you kind of look off to your right 
and you see a piece of driftwood coming down the river. And you have a choice to observe it. And you can say, okay, that's fear of making a mistake. Let's give that a name. And you watch that driftwood come down that current and you elect to just observe it. You've named it, you're not resisting it, you're watching it, and guess what? It's being taken away by the current. It might not go completely out of sight, but it is gonna get further and further away. That's what observation of anxiety looks like. Now the other choice is that you see that piece of driftwood, your fear of making mistakes, and it's coming, and it's coming, you see it, and you decide to participate with it. You step out into the current, you're walking towards it, you go to grab it, to wrestle with it, to, and you start to try to resist it. It locks you in, soon you're in an alligator death roll, and you're drowning in your own anxiety. And that's what I mean, the difference between observing it, that gives you the power. When you participate with it, that actually gives it power over you. So you have a choice when it comes to anxiety. Do you want to observe it or do you want to participate with it? And the last thing I want to say about anxiety, that there are forms that are very disabling and those are not to be taken lightly. Those types of anxieties need professional help, whether it's therapy, therapy and medication, all under supervision. It's really important to get the help that you need so that you can have some relief from performance anxiety. And remember that fear is a waste of imagination. Thank you very much. I hope this was helpful. I'm Carl Baldessar, and I'll see you on the next episode.